Hello everyone, this is Peter Eisentraut recording my presentation for PGCon 2020 from home in Germany. So let's get right to it. So today I want to talk about time series databases and as I usually do, especially at PGCon, I don't want to talk so much about a specific way of doing things or any kind of particular products, but I want to take a topic and actually ask myself, what does this even mean? And then further ask, you know, what does it mean for me as a user or you know, the users that I support? And what does it mean for me as a developer of the Postgres core itself? And that's what I want to do today. Okay. So my first premise here is that time series is a use case. Okay. So time series is a term that's often uh, thrown around in database circles. Uh, it sort of comes and goes uh, over the years as a trend and Oftentimes it comes sort of with a, a big a marketing message that it's a new way of doing you know, databases and it's, it's a, a new paradigm or what have you, right? So my sort of, yeah, uh, premise here is I consider time series to be a use case, just like we have, for example, OLTP. That's a term that is used a lot, but it doesn't mean anything very specific if you think about it. If you are, let's say, a database administrator or a consultant and you come to a new database system and you know, somebody tells you this is an OLTP um, system, that uh, tells you something. It doesn't give you any specifics of what the system is doing or any of its performance metrics, but it gives you an idea of what the system is for and what the characteristics are, right? And so it's probably, you know, has a fair amount of updates and a fair amount of reads usually a smaller transactions, but a lot of them and sort of mainly continuous load and probably so sort of pretty good uptime requirements and uh, the data in there is valuable. So it has to be probably backed up regularly and so on. And, and that, that is understa understandable and that's uh, sort of a handy uh, term to use. And, and so sort of at the almost opposite end of that, you have OLAP, which you know, also tells you things. It tells you it's probably a very big database. It probably has a lot of reads, maybe not so many writes, or the writes may be in, so bulk loaded for, uh, depending on the, the setup. So, you know, those kind of terms help us understand in general what a system is doing and then how we have to think about it and how we have to work with it. But they don't tell you anything specific about, you know, what uh, products you're using or you know exactly what the system is doing so and i i think time series is useful to think of it in that sense also that it is a use case it gives you sort of a, a hint of what the characteristics of the system are but time series is not you know a new database paradigm or you know a, a new way of doing things or and things like that so i think that's a that's a good way to frame it and i want to analyze it in, in that specific way so what uh, are time series databases useful for? So, um, so here are sort of the you know, typical things you could find. The, the sort of most obvious one, and perhaps in the way that a lot of people don't think about it, is any anything to do with server logs or you know web server logs or any kind of logs that have a timestamp and some information on it. Right? That's the basic idea of a time series data. And, and that stuff has been around obviously forever, but where it becomes more popular over sort of more recent times is any anything having to do with measuring sort of real world uh, equipment, uh, either sort of in industry or weather sensors or other sensors, right? You can obviously measure more than weather, but that's a good sort of example to, to think about. And, and, you know, you can, you know, a lot of, uh, measurement in terms of so air quality and things like that are popular nowadays so you can do that and as those sensors become uh, you know, more widely available and cheaper there's more interest in that but also you know anything having to do with the, the, the financial world those are 
that's a data that has uh, time attached and obviously there's a lot of interest in that and just uh, because there's a lot of business in that and and other use cases in in science where people need to, to keep track of things over time and do analysis of that so that, that i think that's a pretty clear where this is coming from if you want to do a little bit more of a buzzword approach to this right sometimes when you're trying to you know maybe sell your idea you need to have a couple of buzzwords you can also deploy these so the internet of things is you know popular that's basically the same idea as having lots of sensors connected to the internet so that's not very different another interesting use case that is mentioned from time to time was self-driving cars uh, mainly because there's a lot of data in those that needs to be analyzed you know, either in real time or just during the development process and uh, that's a has you know there's a, a lot of sensors a lot of data and you know the, obviously the data has to be also processed uh, very quickly right so, so that the the cars can react in in you know split seconds as they should so that's an interest, interesting area of, of research and development where a time series database is uh, relevant. I'm probably not going to put any Postgres database in the self-driving cars uh, anytime soon, but the same ideas apply there. So another thing to clarify is that a time series database is not the same thing at all as a temporal database. And it's perhaps a little bit confusing as both of those terms have time or a form of time in their name and they are also you know popular terms from time to time in the database field but they're not the same at all and um, today i want to talk about time series obviously if you're interested in temporal i could recommend last year's pgcon had a good talk about temporal databases uh, so you can just pull that up. So to have a you know a simple way to tell them apart, perhaps, is that in time series you have records with timestamps, which is you know the time of when that piece of information was recorded or, or observed. Whereas in a temporal database you have timestamp ranges, which in Postgres could be a, you know an actual range type or in a general sense a you know start and end timestamp. And that is the timestamp range when that um, piece of information was valid or is valid or will be valid, depending on what you do. So those are you know, entirely different. Um, you could possibly even have both of them in a, the same database. Uh, might be a little bit complicated, but so let's uh, keep those apart. Okay. So now what makes a time series database? That's the most important thing I want to talk about, right? It's a, it's a, a use case, a, a fuzzy term for a, sort of a collection of characteristics. And I have collected here, you know, based obviously on other people's research and so on for my analysis, I've collected six characteristics that I want to go through of what makes a time series database. And then how is that relevant to Postgres and how can Postgres satisfy these uh, you know, criteria? So I'll go through them in detail. So you know, timestamp is part of the key. That seems kind of obvious. Timestamps are usually in increasing order. Data is usually more inserted, not so much updated. That obviously becomes interesting for certain performance characteristics. Usually, time, time series databases have a lot of data. Um, usually, individual records and older data matter less. It's more the, the aggregate that is more interesting. And time series databases usually try to do analytics based on time, so there needs to be some support for that. So let's look into that in detail. So number one, timestamp is part of the key. So that this is sort of the, the obvious thing that makes a time series database you have data and every row has a timestamp associated with it which is when the value was recorded or measured or you know something like that 
and a, a you know a very straightforward design in a in a relational database would look like this. So just, perhaps some ways you can optimize this and do it differently, but just as a sort of an abstract thing, it would look like this. You have a you know a row with a timestamp, and then usually you have some kind of uh, indication of the sensor in this case or what you're measuring. Now, if you're measuring only a single thing or you only have one point of measurement, you don't need that, but usually you have a lot of those, obviously, right? So you would have some kind of a reference to what the, uh, the, the device was, and then you have some data that you're measuring. And usually not only one, you have probably quite a few of those usually, so the rows could be quite wide. And then usually the combination of the timestamp and some kind of you know indication of what the measurement point was would be the primary key. Whether you actually put a primary key on it or not, or you index it differently is, is beside the point now, right? So that that is how you would set up a time series database in a very straightforward way. So this does not mean that every single table has to have a timestamp as a key, right? There could also be some reference data. So in this case, the, the sensor table would not have a timestamp, but the sort of the main tables with the, with the data would have that. So that, that's straightforward. So how does Postgres support that? Uh, you know, Postgres is great for that. It has really good support for anything having to do with time and date. That is, is widely, it's widely regarded for that. You have, you know, timestamp, timestamp TZ time, uh, data type that you can use for that. You know, or if you somehow don't like that, you can define your own way of uh, recording time. It's maybe not, I'm not necessarily recommending that here right now, but it's something you could also do, right? If you don't want to maybe spend the time, uh, the, the space on a timestamp type, you can measure time somehow yourself and use an integer or a big integer if, if that's the thing you want to do or define your own timestamp type somehow, right? So all the, or for the most part, the, all the data types in Postgres are not special. Timestamps are not that special. You can put in whatever you want. This is how Postgres as a, a more general system is different from specialized time series databases that with the notion of, of timestamps is really usually quite heavily baked in. So you can't really use those systems very well for something that's not a time series database. So if you, you know, it's a, it's often optimized for a specific way of doing things, but if you somehow want to mix sort of different approaches in the database and they're not very good at that, in Postgres everything is more generalized. Second point, timestamps are usually in increasing order. So that makes sense as you record data as you get data from the, the input points, time increases. So the, val the time and the values that you record also increases. Uh, it's not an absolute because you know, different sort of clients could report out of order depending on latency and, and other things like that. So you, you can't build your system around requiring that, but it's, it's a good way uh, to optimize for, right? We'll, we'll come to that a little later in terms of what, uh, you know, queries and planners could do, but this is a an easy thing to optimize for that uh, you think that the values are generally pre-sorted on disk. So how, how does that work in Postgres? The B-Tree implementation in Postgres is uh, has a spe special optimization for this append use case. It um, caches the uh, rightmost leaf page. Um, so that basically means if you just keep appending values, it, it has already sort of pre-cached the insert point for that. You know, this is only an optimization. It doesn't have, you know, you, obviously, B-Tree is also fine for other use cases, but this specific case is, is already optimized for that was put in a couple of years ago. Also, if you have mostly sorted data, that's great for range partitioning. Obviously, in 
we'll come to that a little later, but obviously in a lot of these time series use cases, you want to do portationing. I mean, probably by timestamp, right? That would make sense to do it that way. And so if you have ordered data, then you're usually only writing to one partition. So one partition can be, you know, hard and kept in memory or the index in memory and all the old partitions can don't have to be kept in memory. So that's that's the, how you want to use partitioning. So that works well. And also Brin indexes are uh, useful for that. If you have uh, Brin indexes rely on data being sorted on disk basically so that it can index ranges. That's what the name basically means, right? That the R in Brin is range. So, so if you have entirely mixed data, Brin indexes can't help. Brin indexes summarize ranges. So if data is uh, very well sorted, you can use Brin indexes as an alternative to B tree in, in certain cases, and then you have a much smaller index, and that's good. So this is all. This works all uh, quite well in Postgres. Some room for improvement here, um, especially. Um, this is maybe a minor point here, but there, you know. Brin indexes are very useful, often ignored by users. Um, and there could be more work being done in the planner to use Brin indexes in more situations. For example, um, if you want to order values and you have Brin indexes that already gives you hints of the order of things and the, the planner uh, could make more use of that. So that's something maybe to think about. Other than that, I think this point is quite well covered by Postgres. So then we said uh, new data is inserted, not updated. Right. This is uh, key to this whole uh, design approach uh, if you are setting up a time series database. In a, let's say, in a normal OLTP business database, you usually only keep the current state you know, what is your current set of customers, your current set of inventory, your current set of orders and things like that. And then when things change, you run updates to change, you know, the the address of a customer, the price of a, of a product and things like that. Right? In, the, in a time series database, you basically don't do that. And in the really extreme case, you never update anything. You keep all historical data and when there's a new, a new information, you just add a new record with a new timestamp. Now, if you do this sort of in a very extreme way, for that, obviously that leads to problems that, uh, you know, in terms of space usage and, and application performance, and so there obviously has to be usually a, a middle ground has to be found. But that is the idea, right? You don't update data but you keep all data to some degree. Now, in a way, this also overlaps with temporal databases. Um, so the, here you hear those kind of uh, ideas touch a little bit. You know, the, time, the time series way of looking at it is recording of historical state up to the current time, whereas temporal database is you know, sort of intentionally describing the range of when information is valid or will be valid also into the future. So th this is a little bit where this overlaps. But the general idea is once you have recorded something in the time series, you don't change it because that is you know, a fact of the past. Now, it could sometimes be that maybe corrections have to be applied if it turns out maybe a sensor was faulty or the time you know, the clock was off or things like that. So you can't build a system around never allowing any updates, but you can certainly optimize for not allowing any updates or not having, you usually not having updates. So how can Postgres work with that? Postgres is great for that, right, to a fault. And I mean that Postgres is relatively bad if, in, uh, if you need to update a lot, but if you just append, uh, the current heap is great for that. 
So this is really sort of surprisingly not a problem. Uh, so then, as we mentioned and alluded to, time series databases often have, or usually have, a lot of data because we never, you know, we never change anything. As we just said, we just keep recording everything new. And as you know, business usually goes these days. The more you know, the more data we have, the more value we have. Whether that is actually factually true, is to be debated. But this is sort of how business is sort of focusing often these days to collect a lot of data and then do some kind of analysis on it. It's also you know because it's possible basically. Right? You you storage can be had relatively cheaply so it is more feasible than it was maybe in the past to keep a lot more old data uh, a lot of these uh, you know, sensors and measurement points are relatively cheap might you can set up your own weather stations for really cheap money nowadays and that also applies and then all the other use cases that actually having more measurement points is relatively inexpensive. And, you know, you can also say if you want more data, more value, you can also measure more often. Maybe instead of measuring the weather once a day or once an hour, you measure it every, you know, five minutes or every minute or all the time. There's, you know, hardly any reasonable limit there. The, the main interesting point here is that in a time series database, there is no natural limit of how much data you could have. If you think about this in a OLTP database, in a, in a business database, there is some predictable limit of how much data you will have. So let's say if you have a hotel and you record your you know, hotel reservations, you know, you, you know your hotel has a certain number of rooms and you can only have so many people in a room and in, you know, only like one party a, a, a night and they usually stay a, you know, a couple of nights. So if you multiply this, even if you have a thousand rooms, you know, there you, you're going to have a thousand records per day times 300 or so days so that there is a limit of, you know, how, how much data to expect, even if you have, you know, a chain of hotels and you record all kinds of other things, you know, who has ordered breakfast and things like that, there's still sort of a, a, an upper limit to the multiplier of how much data you will have, even if you're a big retailer and online and you, there is you know, a limited number of customers you have and a limited number of uh, items in your inventory. So you can plan your database. Whereas in a time series database, because of all these factors, you you know the, there's almost no limit. You can collect as much data as you you want or you can afford. And whether that is sensible and valuable is perhaps another question. That you know, how much how useful is it to measure the weather every five minutes versus every hour? You know, that's something that domain experts would have to answer. But Certainly, the the pressure is there to always get more and more, and so that this, these kinds of databases are often very difficult to plan for because you don't really know how much data you might want to get. Okay, so how can Postgres help with lots of data? So as we know, heap is is not great for space usage, uh, mainly because of tuple header and there could be some more optimizations there. There are other storage engines being either considered or have already been put out uh, for that reason and related reasons to have just more compact storage. Certainly partitioning is there to help with space usage and then based on partitioning sharding, which you know partitioning over multiple hosts is something that there's some support in Postgres for that. But there are certainly lots of 
ways to improve that. So here's a, a long list of you know, how do we make you know, handling large data better in Postgres. So we could you know, work on making the table storage itself more, more compact so, you know, with uh, you know, different storage engines or different tuple header rep representation or you know, various details like that. That work is, you know, is underway. Uh, there could be a lot of work in the area of compression in all kinds of ways. So, you know, toast compression is uses you know as a, a, an outdated, let's say, outdated compression algorithm. So, putting something better in there would certainly help somehow. You know, is toast applicable to a time series use case? That depends. If you use the, uh, you know, the schema I, sh I showed earlier, where you have mostly numbers being recorded, then probably not so much, but in practice, people also store you know, JSON data. Maybe that's the JSON data that they get from whatever the measurement point is, and then you just record that. That's obviously not optimal at all, but that's what people use. So some toast um, optimization would certainly be useful. And then there's other ways maybe to do compression to think about. You know, on a block level, you can use file system uh, file systems that can compress. Or oh, there's also perhaps ways to compress in a way that's specific to the data. So let me explain that. If you you know record a time series records you know, consisting of a timestamp and then some you know data items that is the the items that are being measured between adjacent records the data is probably not going to be very different so if you measure every minute you have you know, that the next timestamp is only one minute different from the previous one but also the data being measured is probably not that different so if you measure let's just keep it a simple case to measure the temperature again the temperature is probably either not going to change at all or it's going to be very similar. So you could use some kind of a, a run length encoding or, or something similar to that, and there's certainly more specific ideas there, to optimize the storage of that. So instead of say, you know recording everything explicitly, timestamp value value, timestamp value value, you could optimize that somehow and say, you know, the first row you store timestamp value value and then the next row you just store the difference. And then you don't need to use the full, you know, 12 bytes for, you know, the timestamp or the full eight bytes or whatever you have for the values. You can just store like a small difference. And that could certainly have massive, massive storage uh, uh, savings exactly how to represent that especially so in postgres how would you do that in postgres what would that be is that you know a compression method is that a storage method how would you fit that into the system i don't know yet you know there that sort of system is also you know would be very difficult to make updatable so that's more sort of for the, the uh, archival end of the data and you would have to query it in a specific way so this would all be slower but it would be a very good way to compress things uh, for the, the, the cold end of your data so that's something to think about so so again lots of options there for compression um, certainly the partition management could be improved I think partitioning itself is you know has evolved really uh, well with the last uh, you know, few releases and the performance there is, is pretty good now but the management of partitions is has not been considered all, all that much so for example a very straightforward use case would be i would like one partition per month or one partition per day 
this is not easy to set up right now. You have all the commands and there are some extensions that can help you manage that, but it should perhaps be simpler and just say make the next partition or make the partitions for the next week or any, something of that sort that, that would sort of be, I think that would be helpful. And then on the, the bigger scale, anything to do with charting is obviously currently only building blocks and you know the, the improvements there are there are a number of um, uh, things that could be improved there so that's a, that's a long list of its own so in individual records uh, matter or less uh, usually people are interested in the aggregated data and also older data matters less so there's are two sub points here and so the fact that the temperature reading at a specific time a week ago was that is not that interesting. If you lose that one record and you have the record of you know five minutes before or after, that's that's not a disaster. What matters is the 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 aggregated data or the, the bulk data. So that gives you certain options for optimizing perhaps. Now this depends on, on the use case. Sometimes if this is a system of record, obviously you can't do that. If you're recording financial data somehow, perhaps, then you probably have other requirements. But if you're just you know measuring stuff out there in the world and you're trying to make a little bit of, a, of a analysis and modeling, then one individual record is not the most important thing. Also, as you know, all the data is usually not that important. Again, that depends on the use case. If you are doing, you know, historical analysis of, of weather patterns or air pollution patterns, and you need the old data just as much as the new data, but if you are observing, you know, your web traffic or your server traffic, and you're trying to find maybe uh, performance deviations, then the new data is more relevant, and the old data is, you know, access less and maybe only there for reference. So. How can Postgres help with that? Again, partitioning, as I mentioned already before, is good for that because then you can keep the hot data and the cold data separate if that's the kind of use case. You can, you know, asynchronous commit is very applicable to this so that you don't have to, you know, if you have a lot of data being you know, inserted all the time, so single row by single row, you can turn asynchronous commit on or synchronous commit off the way it is uh, said, and then you get a little bit of a performance boost and you know, the risk of losing valuable data is, uh, is low or eliminated because you can obviously set that also per transaction. So it's very, very flexible and very useful for this. Yeah, and you can also, for perhaps this is sort of depends on really the use case, materialized views can be useful that if you just want to throw old data away and just compact it and pre-compute materialized views, that's useful. And you can also then you know, maybe use table spaces if you have sort of, you know, want to put sort of older, older data maybe on slower storage and things like that. Room for improvement, again, partition management. And in this case, specifically the lifecycle management of the partitions themselves, not so much as we said in the previous uh, point, you know, making new partitions, but here getting rid of the old partitions, basically. We have an open item that in Postgres currently you can attach new partitions without a heavy lock, but you cannot detach. So that's, that's well known, that's being worked on, that's definitely an open item. And then just in general, maybe you, you might think, how about I just want to automatically throw away all partitions that are older than six months or something like that. That seems an obvious use case. You currently have to do that manually. All the tools are there, so this is you know not hard for someone to script or automate but maybe it could be easier. You know, also, you know, the management of table spaces is you know, just very basic. And so maybe there's some ideas there to improve that. And if you want to use materialized views, the 
often discussed materialized view, incremental materialized view refresh could perhaps be useful. Right? So that you can you know, still have new data arriving, but instead of storing it all individually, you could just update the materialized view. So depending on the use case, I think that's also a useful, and that's something that's also already being worked on, so that might just come in handy. All right, and then so finally, the, the, the previous points were all like, how is the database being set up? And how is the data being put in there? And then the question is, what do you actually do with the data? And, you know, and that obviously really depends on the application, but generally you know, people want to do time-based analytics. And usually also, you know, depending again, but usually sort of quick analytics. So these are not long analytics queries that run might run for minutes or hours. Usually one sort of quick summaries of what what was my you know what was my traffic in the last five minutes fifteen minutes what was my last traffic what was my traffic per hour over the last day or two you know that's certainly the if you're processing log files and website traffic that's interesting uh, but even if you are monitoring let's say industrial equipment you you want to know you know quickly if anything is wrong or what's happening if it's overheating or whatever the case may be so. You, you want quick queries, but you still want uh, analytics queries, basically. But then there could also be, of course, long, you know, longer running queries if you're doing, again, weather analysis over a longer time. Those could be heavy queries and very specific, in domain specific queries. What you usually don't do is just a single row lookup, yeah. unless it's maybe in. in you know, you're looking at financial data and you need to have, you know, you need to look up something specific. Generally, you don't use this system to look up like one record and really quickly. It's mostly aggregation. And then on top of that, generally you want some tooling, you know, to, either to, to, you know, enter those queries or explore data or, you know, for any kind of visualization or front ends or, you know, more advanced math on top of data. So there's some requirements to have higher level tooling as well. So how does Postgres support this? You know, obviously analytics support in SQL in general is pretty good and Postgres implements most of that, most of what would be relevant. Obviously, grouping is pretty basic. Window functions are you know, well supported in Postgres now. So that's, that's great, and that's really what makes you know, an SQL database really useful for a time series use case compared to maybe more specialized databases that have a very limited query language that might be really quickly a specific use case, but if you then want to, you know, break out of what they support really well, then you, you might not have any support at all, or you have to program that yourself at client side. So, an SQL database is, you know, is obviously really powerful query functionality. There is some support in Postgres for doing daytime processing, but actually, surprisingly, not a lot, and that's an area to improve in. So, for example, the use case that I alluded to a moment ago, if you want to have, you know, show me my traffic, which would be maybe a count, show me my you know, count per hour over the last couple of days. That's a pretty straightforward, straightforward group by query, and you could use date trunk to truncate the timestamps to the hour, and that would, that would work. Uh, what doesn't work in a, the same way is if you want to have traffic by every 15 minutes. So how do you truncate a timestamp to or round or truncate it as you might want to uh, 15 minute intervals? There's no built-in support for that. So you'd have to somehow make, you know, you could write that yourself, but it's, it's complicated in the details. So better support there would obviously be useful. Yeah, but 
The good thing is Postgres is extensible, especially in this area of functions and operators. So whatever you need, you can add yourself. But yeah, room for improvement, especially what I just mentioned that uh, taking date trunk and expanding that to support arbitrary intervals. Uh, and there could also be more other, um, more advanced functionality if you want to do maybe histograms based on times and things like that. But sort of more, ba there's some more basic gaps that are missing, which would be relatively easy to, to plug. So there's some work already going on on that. And, and then another um, um, necessary improvement in that area for that same use case give me uh, give me you know the information by some interval like an hour or 15 minutes if you use day trunk or something similar the plan the, this kind of um, uh, the, this loses information in the planner so if you if you're in a complex query and you have sorted input what the planner thinks is sorted input or mostly sorted input. And then you run, you know, as the, in the case of the timestamps, the timestamps are we said are mostly sorted. And then you run date trunk, you know, the, the, over them, the planner doesn't know anything about that. And so it doesn't think that the output of that is sorted anymore. And then it would have to use other plans. So this could be sort of the difference between a, a group aggregate and a hash aggregate. Even though we well, we we know, as you know, implementers, we know that something like date trunk would preserve the order of the input, but the planner doesn't have any information about that. So that would be something that's also already been vaguely discussed some time ago. To add another function attribute of some sort to tell the planner that this is an order preserving function or whatever you want to call it, but order preserving is probably um, a good way to describe it. So those two first things are would be really useful for you know, just supporting basic time bucking, bucketing uh, queries, um, and they're well within reach and, and not too hard. So and then there's you know on the tooling side there's I think many opportunities outside of Postgres Core for. Visualization frameworks or any kind of query construction frameworks or additional sort of extended math uh, extensions and things like that. So that's not something that necessarily belongs into Postgres itself, but uh, certainly you know, external tools for that would be uh, useful. Okay, so those uh, are, is my discussion of uh, those time series uh, characteristics. Here's a summary of the development projects that I mentioned and proposed um, sort of ordered in a way that maybe I would do them. This is not necessarily priority, but a combination of most useful and easiest to do perhaps. And uh, a lot of those are already in progress in one way or another. Not all of them under the time series banner also you know, addressing other use cases, but there's a lot of interesting things that could be done to uh, make Postgres better for this. So, and you know, as I mentioned, some of these are already in progress, some of them not so much. So, you know, some of them, basically most of these are on my radar somehow, but certainly if someone else wants to you know, look into that or collaborate, that'd be welcome. All right, so to summarize, so I think Postgres is is great for time series, uh, and it's you know, a, a universal database system, and it has shown itself to be adaptable to many different use cases. That as we've shown with you know, some key value stores, JSON, and things like that. I think it's a it's a has sound fundamentals and can be extended in different ways for different use cases. That said, there is, you know, there are go, always going to be more specialized systems out there that are, 
you, know, you have a specific use case in mind and then we'll beat any universal system. We know that very well. There's you know, key value stores that are you know, in memory perhaps and super optimized and you know, will beat any generalized database system certainly, but that, that, that's not the point, right? That's not what we should aim for. The aim is to be a, a general universal database system but also have you know, facilities that cater to specific use cases. And the, you know, lots of improvements are possible, but they're all within reach and they're all reasonable. Uh, they're all mostly already conceived and in progress. So if, if all of that comes together or many of those come together, then it'd be even a greater time series database. Okay, so that is my presentation. Um, at the actual conference, there will be now questions. So I'll look forward to answering those. If you're not there, then also feel free to reach out to me uh, you know, via my contact information if you want to chat about you know, some of these development projects or you have sort of comments on my classification of things. Or you just want to chat about Postgres, feel free to reach out. Uh, that said, I hope to see all of you soon again at a Postgres conference, uh, and until then, uh, take care. Bye. And cut. Who's here live for the Q&A? Go ahead, Peter. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, so I'll just go through the... IRC here. Um, the question of how the B tree append optimization works uh, was already answered in the chat. That's automatic. That was um, added a couple of releases ago, so you don't have to do anything about that. Um, also, the the point that was made in the chat about the new feature in Postgres 13 that uh, auto vacuum is triggered appropriately for insert only tables, which actually that's a very good point. I didn't even uh, address that in my talk. It's obviously very applicable to these kinds of workloads. So that's that's a great improvement, and um, yeah, that that's great. And thank you for pointing that out. Question about. Uh, uh, about Brin indexes. So if you are doing updates on records that will you know, potentially break uh, Brin indexes, well, what would you have to do in that case? So there's nothing really automatic about that to answer that question. Um, what exactly you should do in that case really kind of depends on the exact pattern uh, of what updates you would do. You know, if you, if it's affecting maybe your entire partition, then maybe you can just re, you know, cluster that table possibly. There's also uh, special functions for Brin indexes that can sort of, uh, they're called Brin summarize range and Brin summarize new values um, to, to make sort of specific changes there. So perhaps do look into the documentation of Brin indexes to find out details about that. But yeah, in principle, in general, if you do updates on Brin indexes, then uh, it, you could uh, run into uh, slight problems. You might have to rebuild. A uh, question from, I believe, Vic, right, about uh, anyone working on automatic partition creation. Uh, so the way I would see that working is, I don't know exactly what you, what you envision there is uh, the, what I think we'll, we will not do is create the partitions sort of at the time of insertion. I think that uh, people have agreed that that's, um, it would create all kinds of bizarre locking and concurrency problems and rail cache and that kind of stuff. So if you're looking for that, I don't think anyone's really working on that. Uh, what I would en envision uh, as uh, you know, next steps would be sort of in indicating at the time you create the partition table to say, you know, I want this to be a partition by month. And then you just have a command that says alter table or, you know, something like that say make me the next four partitions and then it kind of knows what pattern you want or you could also imagine that for hash partitions which is not applicable here but you could say you know, i want 16 partitions just grade them all uh, so that is something that uh, i think we've looked 
into internally at second quadrant and uh, we might work on that for postgres 14 uh, that's sort of a, a soft uh, you know roadmap item um other than that i don't know any other work uh on that uh a question from don um dropping an old partition is the same as a detach basically yeah so that also requires the the heavy lock uh, that's something uh, Alvaro is looking at um, fixing in Postgres 14. Um, that the the initial implementation of the concurrent attach turned out to be different from his initial implementation. That's why he had to rework the entire uh, concurrent detach. But it, that's something it's in progress. But yeah, right now it it's, it requires a heavy lock. Uh, okay, what else? Uh, yeah, more work, more stuff on the auto vacuum. Uh, question from Jasper: Do you think that with the new Beecher index in thirteen, that set store become should become an option for time series? Um, well, that's uh, oh, I, I didn't think about it, that at all. Um, I think that's certainly an option to to think about, depending on how you use it, right? If if you have especially sort of very wide rows, it's an option. Or um, I haven't really thought about it too much, but certainly uh, I wouldn't dismiss it. Yeah, um, and uh, with the sort of the B tree uh, deduplication, I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah, I did watch the Z store talk uh, yesterday and and try to make sense of it. So there's there's more learning to be done there, but yeah. Um, Okay, uh, more questions coming in. Great, time scale DB extension already exists. Does it already implement a lot of things you mentioned could be improved? Yeah, so time scale DB is an extension that addresses a lot of these points. Um, you know, you can use it. It's um, it has a different license in Postgres, so you know, just evaluate that for yourself. Um, I, I think that's great, and they're certainly you know sort of uh, doing a lot of good work there. Um, what I would uh, look for is a little bit more sort of general solutions, like for example the the planner um, sort of the way I described the planner uh, function attributes to hint the planner the way I described that. Uh, my understanding is that you know, time scale DB kind of does it in a more sort of hard coded hacked way and say like this function treated that way, you know that sort of thing. So. Yeah, you can use it, and it's very you know it seems to people like people seem to like it. But it, uh, I, I'm I would look in the long run for more um, you know sort of generalized uh, Postgres like extensible solutions in a lot of these areas. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a I guess a one step in the right direction there. Time scale DB. Uh, recently implemented a needed width width bucket for time stamp TZ. Um, I was going to submit that as a patch. Yeah, submit that patch. I don't have anything. I don't know anyone else is uh, working on that. I, I, you, you are aware of the work by uh, John Naylor to implement uh, the sort of enhanced version of date trunk that I mentioned. Uh, I, uh, there's no other work in progress right now. Yeah, uh, do look into time scale DB. Just, you know, I'm not going to look into source code because there's licensing differences. So I can't really comment more about that i'm just reading their documentation and uh, they certainly you know asked a lot of the right questions um uh, just maybe different opinions on how the answers should be implemented um uh, the, 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 let's talk about automatic partitioning yeah automatic partitioning it sounds good but it's uh, nobody's really working on that I missed a bunch of your answer. First bit of video was cut off. I'm sorry, uh, Russ, your question was about uh, B3, uh, B, uh, Brin. Yeah, Brin, Brin is, uh, no, it doesn't do that automatically. Read the documentation, sorry. Uh, I'm going through the IRC. I should probably read the questions. Um, uh, read the questions out loud. Yeah, okay, so you re-asked the question about Brin. Yeah, the question about Brin, it does, yeah, those updates do break. There's nothing automatic that fixes it. You, uh, but there are functions specific for Brin to do certain adjustments depending on what you're doing. 
A question about custom type creation. Documentation says types are implemented using mostly C. Is it possible to create type using SQL language? Um, the answer to that is, I believe, no. Not right now, because you, you do need to um, you know, basically take input, string input, and convert it to a byte pattern for storage. So the SQL can't do that. You could maybe, you know, one example that is probably currently not possible, but you can imagine doing it in something like Rust where you can sort of lay out bits and, and write them sort of on that level, but uh, not in uh, just plain SQL. That's not possible right now. Question from David Fedor. Any wins to be had from SIMD? I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. If anyone, uh, we still have a couple minutes. If anyone got their question cut off, please ask it again. I'm just monitoring the IRC. Uh, also a question that I just answered from Marius46 about wanting to convert units like liters and gallons. There's actually an extension for that PostgreSQL uh, hyphen units, I believe it's called. So just check that out if you're interested in that. Yeah, I don't know, Vic, if you got my answer to your question, but with bucket, please just submit that patch. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Anyone know what SIMD? Single instruction, multiple data. Um, so is that sort of vector processing? I am, I'm sorry, I still don't know really what that is. I've heard that before, but um, I have not thought about that. So I probably even if I knew what that was, I don't have an answer. But uh, if it's sort of, um, there's certainly further improvements in sort of execution, execute optimization possible that go beyond what I have really uh, uh, thought about here. That's all the questions now? Yeah, vector processing. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think it would, I, I think it could definitely benefit from that. Uh, that's, you know, goes a little bit beyond what I had thought about. And it, obviously that would also affect, you know, a bunch of other, uh, mostly analytics use cases uh, in, in general. So definitely also, yeah, maybe that those are not the sort of the, the top issues, but yeah, let's add that to the near the bottom of the list. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Uh, so the um, you know a lot of the items I mentioned are in progress, as we have also just discussed. Now, some of those are already in the next very next commit fest. Some of those are you know being worked on here and there. If anyone wants to know specifically, like who is working on what, maybe. You know, just uh, drop me a line, and uh, otherwise, I'll uh, you know hope to see you all soon again, uh, or I'll see you at the next commit fest. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.